I want us to look at uh, two small sayings. They're ones that you know, but I want to remember them once again. The first one is the story of Samuel. Don't look it up now because it takes time. Samuel chapter, uh, Samuel book 1 and chapter 15 and verse 22. But this was the situation when King Saul was sent out to go to battle against the heathens. And Samuel, the God's man, gave them God's will. Go, you'll win victory, but don't, uh, don't steal the plunder. Don't take anything from the family. Don't take their house. Don't take their clothing. Don't take their sheep and their goats. Go and you'll win, but you don't take any plunder. You don't steal anything. And sing King Saul, he went to war and he had a wonderful time and everybody got killed. You know, in the, the Old Testament, everybody gets killed sooner or later. <laughs> but uh, he, he, he thought that was wonderful, but he said to the soldiers, get out among the villages and take what you will. And they forgot. The ruling laid down in God's name by Samuel. Samuel went down after the battle, and as he came near to the camping of the soldiers, he heard sheep and goats. And he said, oh, who are these uh, goats and sheep? Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the soldiers like to take a little something. I, I wouldn't let them do anything very much, but I thought one or two things would be good. Uh, and, of course, I, I've taken one or two of these rams and goats and we've, we've put them on the, on the altar of the Lord. Look what we've done with what we've uh, taken. And the prophet was absolutely furious. God said not to take it. Give the nation after you won it. Give them the wherewithal to live. You've been against God's will. To obey is better than sacrifice. Do what God wants you to do. It's more important than anything else. Okay, it looks beautiful to put things on the altar and say, look, Lord, what I brought you, but what he wanted was your obedience, you see. Now Jesus is talking. Jesus is saying there was a man who built his house upon the sand. A man who hears what I say and doesn't do it, he's a fool. And the build that he housed, the house that he builds will collapse and come to nothing. The rain will come down, the flood will come up, the wind will blow and your house because it's not built upon the yes of God. And the man that builds his house upon the obedience of God, his house, his structure, his future is strong and nothing will destroy it. Now, I've heard lots of people preaching this gospel, and they miss the point. They say Jesus was saying, he's the rock and you build on him. He didn't say that. He said, those that do what I tell them to do, they're the wise, and those that don't do it, they'll come to catastrophe. So, my theme for tonight is to obey is what God wants. And other things may be beautiful in their way. I think the Lord wants me to be an officer in the Salvation Army. I've been in it now for 52 years, so I suppose it's okay. <laughs> but he doesn't want just a Salvation Army officer with a nice bit of gold trimming around the back. It's, it's all right. Doesn't make much difference to the salary anyway. 
but it's all right, the army system, with its, its organization and its, its dri discipline and all that. That's good, but to obey is better. It's that what counts. And if John Gowns doesn't do what God wants him to do, he can write nice books and produce nice songs and he can speak sometimes reasonably rationally. But if I don't do what he says, it's, it's pretty. But what I want is your yes. Your yes. Now, of course, we've had down the years some funny pictures of God. If you, write, if, you write, if you read in the Old Testament, you know, you've got to be careful. When it says God says this and God says that, you've got to say, what does Jesus say? Because Jesus is clearer than anything in the Old Testament. The picture of God as a bully is a wrong picture. God is not a bulldozer who pushes his way and makes you do what he wants you to do. He's not that God at all. He is a, a loving, patient, generous father. He doesn't push, force, impose. He asks, he suggests. And you know, the Lord has never bellowed to me all these years. I've known what his will was, but he's never said, John, you've got to do it, get it, do it. Now, I don't want to hear anything else, do it, do it. No, I've never heard him say that. But I've said to him often, uh, John, uh, just a little word. I'm not suggesting that I'm telling you what to do, but I, making a suggestion might be, might be a good thing. Now, you got, you got a letter from a, an officer, and he told you a bit of his mind about you, and it wasn't very flattering, I know. Uh, but I've had a little look at the letter you're writing back. Yes, Lord, I've written quite a nice letter, really. It's what I call a burnt-edged letter. My dear Captain, this is disgraceful attitude. You'd have the right to talk to me like this. And it's a lot of rubbish what you say, and God bless you, you know. With that. <laughs> now, the Lord has never said, get down there and put it right. No, no, he says, well, now... If you're asking me, I wasn't actually, but <laughs> if you're asking me, I think uh, it'd be a good idea to take that letter and tear it up and try it another way. Yes, Lord, but don't you think he deserves it? Well, maybe he does, but that doesn't help anything. Now, write another letter. Dear George, it's always better than saying dear Captain, it's friendly like. So you say, dear George, I'm sorry they're in such a bad temper about me and you don't really understand. When you're round, come and have a coffee with me and we'll talk about it. In the meantime, pray for your leader because it's a terrible business. Try it that way. And to obey is always better. Always better. He speaks. You know, people are so narrow. They say, oh, God speaks to the Christians. He speaks to everybody. Those that have never heard of the Holy Spirit, they don't know. They've had a row with mother. And the girl says, I'm never going to go home. And I, she rings the phone and she says, Mom, I'm not coming home. This is not a Christian girl. And she bangs down the telephone. Something. Don't you think you'd better go home and kiss your mother on both cheeks? Oh, I'm not going to do that. 
she, but, but she's unhappy. Well, she deserves to be unhappy. Yeah, but if you stay away, she'll be so heartbreaking. Now, just go round and slip through the door, and if she's watching the television, creep up and put your arms round your mother. And don't say it. I'm not doing Yes, please, please do. If you won't do it for my sake, do it for your sake. This is the God who says to obey. It's better. It's better for everybody, but it's better for you. I'll tell you, when I've said what God wanted me to do, it's been the better for me and the happier for me. When I've, in my stupidity, insisted that I would do it my way, how I've suffered for it. And I've hurt other people as well as the person who's hurt me. God is not a bully. He wants us to do his will for your sake. And his plan for you, for your life, is so beautiful. And he wants to do it, and he's longing to do it, but he will not steamroll you out and flatten you out and say, now do as you're told. He's got a beautiful design for everybody. More beautiful than you can ever think. And he says, let's do it my way, for your sake. And the timing of the will is very important. I want you to do it now. Now, when I was 19 years and a half, I went to the training college because the Lord wanted me to go to the training college when I was 19 and a half. Now, the Lord can get you in the training school when you're 55, but, but for me, he wanted me when I was young, when I still had energy, and by, I had energy. He didn't wait till I was an old man like this at 30, you know. <laughs> he, now, it is true. When it comes to things like ministry, the timing has to be right. And 19 was right for me. I'd just come out of my military service. I'd been a sergeant in the British Army. Can you believe it? You don't look like it, do I? No, I don't. And when I went in to see the colonel of the regiment and say, I want to leave school, I want to leave the, the, um, the regiment, uh, I want to leave it 10 days early. 10 days early, you, you've got 10 days more to do. But I want to go to the Salvation Army's training college. The Lord says I've got to do. Really? <laughs> the regulations say you've got to do two years. What are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to be an officer in the Salvation Army. Oh, he said, that's different. And he got the thing fixed, and I went into the, straight from the British Army into the Salvation Army. And my face, my first uniform was a cadet's uniform, because I didn't like it before. I never had a uniform before. But the Lord said, for me, it was right. And I'll tell you, I've had some knocks, you know. I was 16 years a corps officer, 13 years a territorial commander, three and a half years the general, God help him. <laughs> but his timing was right. And if you don't say yes, He's going to spoil it. He's going to say no. And he says, please, please, say no to my plan for you. And sing yes now. Tell your story. It sounds like a lie, but it's true. So I know the lady concerned. She was a Welsh lady. And I've seen her testimony. She put it in the book. And I've seen her, and she was a great girl. She was a, a lieutenant in the Salvation Army, a young officer. And uh, she went to a, some special meetings in Manchester. And there was a, a lady officer who'd been working in Africa. And she was pleading in this big congregation saying, God wants more women officers 
in Africa and surely the Lord is asking somebody to come and this officer sat there her name was Evelyn if I remember rightly she said yes Lord but not yet and the spirit spoke to her go forward and say you're ripe for Africa she said no no I, I, I'm still doing a good time at the at the core but I, I don't think I should be a missionary officer but says the spirit you're a trained teacher they want a pastor and a teacher at a special place in africa and the girls please please do it say yes to me and she said no i'm not doing it now and she didn't do it one year every easter because there were special meetings for easter every easter the lord said I still want you. Would you consider it? You don't think the Lord speaks like that? Oh, yes, he does. It says in the book, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I don't break the door in. I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice, I'll come in and we'll have supper together. This is the spirit that we've got to deal with. Eight years, nine years, in the tenth year, feeling condemned, she went to the overseas department at headquarters and said, I feel I ought to go to Africa. And they sent her to Africa. And they sent her to a place in Africa where there was a corps which had never had an officer, ever. And the, you know, in Africa, they make their own ideas, you know. If nobody sends a corps, they make a corps, you know. I, I spoke to an officer uh, who's the leader in one of the African territories, and I said, how many corps have you got, Commissioner? He says, I don't really know. They're always opening them. <laughs> they leave where they are, and they go to another village, and there's no corps. So they say, there's no corps, we must make one. That's aggressive Christianity, brothers and girls. Now we say, well, there has to be three or four board meetings. There has to be five or six years of consultation. We discuss who we could possibly put in there. But while you're doing that in Africa, they're getting down to it themselves. That is, you know, we believe in the priesthood of all believers, and every salvationist is an evangelist, whether he's the captain of a nobody. In fact, the nobodies are not too bad at all. Well, here she goes, and she's going to this place where there's never had an officer. But there's a little meeting, about 50, 60 people, and they've made themselves a little school. They've never had a school because they haven't got a school teacher. But they've been praying for the Lord to send. Please, Lord, these beautiful Africans were pleading for the Lord to send them an officer to be the pastor of our corps and the schoolmistress of our school. Please, Lord. And, and they've been praying a long time. And this lady officer arrived at the welcome meeting and she held hands at the beautiful circle and the sergeant major got into the, into the ring and said oh lord thank you you've answered our prayers you know that for 10 years we've asked for a pastor and a teacher and now you've answered Obedience. Immediately. The timing is never wrong for him. A worker who works as he pleases is not God's kind of worker, but he wants people who will hear what I say and give it serious consideration. He's so polite that it embarrasses you, doesn't it? Doesn't it? 
And the Holy Spirit, I think you'd do better, Lord, if you took me by the scruff of the neck and made me go where I'm going. Wouldn't that be simpler? Yeah, but it wouldn't be any good because I only want servants who are happy in their service. But it's dangerous to move things forward that you love when you love it, how you love it, when there's a wise counselor called the Holy Spirit who will guide you if you let him. Now I'm going to say something that maybe you won't like. So I'm telling you, you can put your, your umbrella up and let it all run off if you like. Be careful that we don't make detours in the service of Christ, which isn't the service that he particularly wants, in the way he particularly wishes you to have it done. Now, let's start with an important thing. I think it's marvelous and I, you know, I'm an old man now, I've, I've watched it for a long time. I think it's marvelous that the Salvation Army has given a fantastic importance as never before at what we call worship. Now believe me, and whatever else you quote me as saying, hold this in your mind. The general said, one of the most beautiful things that is happening in the church of the Salvation Army is the worship offered to God. And I'm sure he's pleased about it. When I hear these big congregations praising the Lord and raising their hands, praising God, there's a lot of praising. That's all right. It's beautiful. But now, just pause for a minute. Don't get, get me wrong. But to obey is better than worship. To obey is better than being a music player. To obey is better than knowing your Bible from back to front. You can be a minister of the gospel, but if you're not obedient, obedience is better than a ministry without obedience. You see, worship is to do with a relationship. And when I say I worship God, or the Spirit, or Jesus, when I worship them, I am putting him in the important place where he can ask what he likes and I'll do it. That is worship. And all that you're singing about in your worshiping is that I'm putting you in the top job. Yours is the eminence. Yours is first. Worship is obedience first. There's a, there's a terrible bit there. I, I didn't read it to you. It's, it's, it's so awful, really, but it's in Luke chapter 6, where Jesus says something that hurts me, and he never does if he can help it. But he hurts me when he says to his disciples, and we're his disciples, when he says to us, to me, why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I ask you? I'm not making it up, it's there. This is the words of Jesus. To whom? To whom? To us, his disciples, the people who say we belong to Jesus. 
And he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? When you don't do what I ask. To obey is even better than worship. Because worship without obedience is rubbish and insulting. To say, Lord, Lord, and say, well, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. I'm not changing that job just because you think I should. I'm not going to do this in the corps because the officer thinks it, and you seem to think it, but I'm not going to do it. If you're doing that, you can go, Lord, Lord, as much as you like. But what he'd love to hear is a yes. The yes of obedience. I want the Salvation Army to be a great and effective, aggressive Christian church, but I want it to obey. And if it obeys, believe me, we'll be short of nothing and short of nobody. We'll have all the people we need and all the money we need and all the resources we need if half the Salvation Army would say yes, yes, Now, I've been around the world, you know, and it's very moving. But I have the feeling that in the East, there's more obedience. And what we need is more obedience, working for Jesus without obedience is to do something he didn't ask you for. But I'm doing it like this. You're pleased, aren't you? Well, it's nice, but this is what I want you to do. This is what you ought to be. This is how you reach your highest potential because when you do my will, you're the biggest strongest, more beautiful, the most useful person when you say this to me. Do try, come on. Let's do it together. Because when we say yes to Jesus, we are closer to him than any other time. He's there in you. The trouble is that half of Christendom has got the door closed and they hear the Christ outside who says, I, I'm, I'm standing at the knock. Now we've got to wait. You know that. God Almighty has to wait till you say yes. You're little gods, aren't you? Well, God made you in the image of God. And one of the things that God gave to the human being is the choice to say no. John O'Gowns, when God says do this, can say no. And I'll tell you, sometimes I have and haven't I regretted it. It's damaged my usefulness sometimes. And made me a less beautiful person. By beauty, I mean holiness. To obey is better than service, better than anything. Look at Jesus. What is he doing? He's kneeling down in the garden and he's talking to the Creator Father, but it's especially his. And he's saying, humanly, Lord, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Let me miss this one. This business of crucifixion. Can, can I be excused if I don't do that bit? It's normal, it's human to say it, there's price in obedience. And you don't want it. 
Jesus says, if it's possible. But, nevertheless, if that's what you want, we're going to do it. And thank you, Lord, because we've all been saved because Christ said yes. He could have passed it, but he drank it. And we are in the family of God because of him. The will, the possibility to choose is the most beautiful thing you can give to God. It's better than anything you can do or anything you can give that's more precious to God than the yes. Lord. Now, I don't know. I wish I did. I wish I was a, one of these people who see past the surface and knew what they were thinking, you know. If I could lift the top off here and there and see what you're thinking while I've been talking for this last minute. And some of you have been putting the door up. Oh, oh, watch it, he's knocking. He's using his poor servant John to tell you that he's knocking. And you're fastening up close. If I'm not careful, I'll be doing what he wants. Oh, yes, I don't know how many. I won't ask for a show of hands, but there's quite a few here. I'm telling you, quite honestly, I've been a long time in this business, and I'll tell you there's a good percentage in every Salvation Army congregation who are trying to dodge the will of God and don't want to hear what he has to say. And there'll be some here who God's speaking to you, and you're saying, I can fix John Gowers. But it's not me that's talking. It's him that's talking. Now, just for a minute. If he was to stand at the door of your personality and he opened the door because you opened it for him, what would he be asking? What would he be saying? Oh, he'd be excited, you know. Oh, I've wanted this woman to open her door for you and today she's going to do it and there's a boy who said at last I'm going to do it all. Oh, he's so pleased. Now let's get down. There's things to be done. It'll take a, a terrible job to do everything I've got in view for you but come on, let's, let's get started. Scared. <laughs> Scared. To the people who say yes, God says, look, I'm with you always. The closest I've ever been to Jesus is the time when I've most said yes. <sighs> I've got so much to say and I don't go on saying you'll be a opening the other door and clearing off, which won't do me any good at all. How many of you? What percentage of you? You say, Lord, Lord. And Christ is saying to you, do you love me? Like he said to Peter, do you love me? If you love me, they're the most obedient they are. You don't have to persuade those that love him deeply. They run after him. What's next, Father? We're talking about this text just this year and I'll close up with this one. Jesus said now, it, it, if you haven't noticed it you need to take a, a deep breath before it gets to you. Jesus said to his disciples 
I don't call your servants anymore. Do you know that? To his disciples, that's us. I don't call your servants anymore. Servants don't know what the master's up to. Servants haven't a clue. They just do as they're told, blind. You're not a servant who just goes on uh, mechanically without any thought or discussion. No, no, you're not servants. You're my friends, says Jesus. It's there in the book. I'm not his servant anymore because servants don't know what he's up to. I'll tell you, I know what he's up to. I know what he's up to in the world. He's trying to cleanse it and more beautiful. I know what he's trying to say in America and it's a transformation of the whole nation. And I know what he wants to do in me and he's got his own plans. I'm not his servant. We're in it together. We are partners in the saving of the world. John, Gowans and Jesus. Yes, it sounds so big-headed, doesn't it? But that's what it is and I'm proud of it, let me tell you. Every disciple of Jesus is a cooperator with Jesus. And the teacher who's in cooperation with Jesus will never ask you to do anything without him being with you. And he won't propose anything that's beyond your strength to do it, given that he will be with you, with you. Okay. Don't let's get too worried about it. Paradoxically, the obedient are the most free. You know what they say to me? They, they always ask me the same questions, you know. People say, they're going to have some questions with the, with the general and we're going to put a few questions. They will shake him and, and worry him because he's never had these before and I've had them every time. They always ask the same thing. <laughs> they say to me, John, you're a very free spirit, really. You've always done what you wanted to do, haven't you? And you've been doing some outrageous things, really. I mean, you know, putting musical comedies on stages, on all ten of them over a period of 30 years, it, it wasn't something that the Salvation Army liked very much, you know. They wished it dead, some of them, until people got saved through them, and then it changed their, you know, they thought they say it's their idea. Well, I don't care whose idea it is as long as it gets done, do you? But paradoxically, they, you see, they think that I've been, oh, you've been restrained. You've been kept down and kept back. You haven't been able to be your full self, my foot. <laughs> I have been totally libert at liberty since I did Jesus' will. There's freedom in his service. Amen. Now, this is the beginning of a very interesting and a very important meeting. I'm just touching the idea of what aggressive Christianity is. Aggressive Christianity, in my idea of things, is the obedient friend of Jesus who does his will. And you'll do things you don't want to do. You'll go places and say, I can't do that. And you'll go and you'll do it. The collaborators of Christ Maybe I should have, well, you know, when you're a general, you can choose the name of the sessions of the cadets. And uh, I, I would rather like now, if I had the chance, to say the collaborators of Christ. 
we're in partnership with him. Now here's a moment of, of importance. We're talking about aggressive Christianity. I'm for it. And what it means to me is whatever it costs, the will of God shall be done by his people and they won't be afraid of doing anything. And the kingdom will come. Now, has, um, it's, it's a, it's a rea rea not a real question, has anybody here been listening to the Spirit when those so songs were given and when the talking was given and when the preachers preached? Right at the beginning of this marvelous meeting and scandal Is there anybody who'll say yes? It's a, a blank check, you know. You can't say, I'll do this and this and that, but don't expect me to do the other. No, that's not. I'm looking for someone who says yes. Whatever it costs, whatever it counts, Whatever it means. I don't know what it means. I'm going out like Abraham, not knowing whether he went, but he went where God told him to go. To obey is better than ever. Now, here's the place. Come on. Does anyone want to come and stand here so we can bless you? I'm not going to stand here and play, plead with you. I'm not pleading for me. I'm pleading for God. And we shouldn't be kept long pleading for him. Someone stands up, comes forward, just to let it be known. I'm going to say yes to the Lord in my life. Yes, Lord. I don't care what it counts, where it goes, what it means, what it does. This weekend is going to be marvelous, provided there's plenty of yes because aggressive testify, aggressive ministry is an expensive one and you'll do things that you didn't know you could. What are you saying to him? Yes, that's it. Yes, Lord. What can I do for you, Lord? I'm here with my ideas and my strength, my physical strength, my emotional strength, everything I've ever learned, everything I've ever gathered, it's all yours, Lord. What do you want me to do with it? And Lord, we know that if your Salvation Army will say yes more often, it will be so effective that the angels would laugh for another thousand years. So glad to see these folks standing around me. I'm not going to hang it about and, and make a long pleading, but I do want those who feel they should register, not before me, but before Jesus. I'm saying yes, Lord, and I mean it. And if I change my mind tomorrow, send your spirit again to rekindle the flame immediately. I want to be on fire for you.